Ladies and gentlemen, our, our next speaker is going to be connecting through podcasts with Ms. Hannah Hethman. Hannah Hethman is the owner, executive producer at Better Lemon Creative Audio, a podcast, produ uh, podcast production company specializing in podcasts for museums, cultural nonprofits, and other mission-driven organizations. She has produced shows for institutions like the Smithsonian, the UK National Archives, and the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Hannah Hethman. All right, mic on, yes, great. All right, hi everyone. Um, glad to be here. Um, first of all, I have a link here if you wanna download these slides. There's a few slides where I've just loaded some information in and I'm gonna jump over it quickly, but if you want, if this is something you're interested in, you want this information, there'll be the link at the end as well. That's tinyurl.com slash dinfospod. So, as said, I make podcasts for primarily museums and history organizations, universities, cultural nonprofits. Um, but I was a barista with a DINFO's teacher 15 years ago, and she kept in touch with me. Um, and so, um, but I think there's a lot of overlap between what you might be interested in doing with podcasts and what cultural nonprofits, nonprofits are interested in. You might be interested in informing people, raising awareness, building community and engaging audiences in your mission. So what I'm gonna do is try and present everything that I've learned over five years of doing this for nonprofits in a way that hopefully will help you apply to your own work podcasting to connect with audiences internal and external. Um, just a quick show of hands for the people in here in person, sorry about the online audience, who listens to podcasts? Yeah, pretty much everyone these days. <laughs> it's changed a lot over five years. And who listens to podcasts about your field, your industry? Yeah, less people. That's me too. I, I listen to cult podcasts when I'm <laughs> not working. And who is thinking about using podcasts at your organization? Oh, a lot of people. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, some reasons to think about podcasting at your organization. Four institutions. Podcasting is long form. This is a social media forum. I hate to say it, podcasting isn't really social media. It's more like programming in the museum field. That's where I'd categorize it. Um, events, things like that. Um, but it's long form. Uh, you're thinking 20 to 40 minutes of audio, sometimes an hour. Uh, the research shows that among regular podcast listeners, and those of you who listen may uh, find this to be true, most people listen to all or most of every episode they start. So you're getting a lot of time with people. It's intimate. 90% of people listen to podcasts by themselves. So it's you, your voice in their ear, and the human voice is, it connects us, right? So if you listen to someone over and over again, you kind of start to feel a connection with them. And it's easy entry. It is a lot easier to make a good podcast than it is to make a good video. I will tell you that. It's harder than good social media, um, but easier than a good video. Um, for audiences, it's accessible. It's available, podcasts are available on demand for free all the time when they're driving to work at four in the morning, when they're taking care of their kids, when they're doing chores, when they're cleaning, whatever it is. Sometimes while they're working, but I won't, I won't tell on anyone. Um, it's con and it's convenient, right? So accessible and convenient. Uh, it's also where the people are. So podcasting, um, when I started 2017, 2018, you really start, started to see things grow exponentially. This data is from 2021, but, you can, but it has kept pace. Um, it's a growing and growing and growing medium. And the interesting thing is there was a lot of money that flowed into podcasting, Gimlet and Spotify, pouring their billions in to try and figure out what the, the Netflix of, of uh, podcasts gonna be. And all that money has sort of started to collapse and they've been laying off people and it's been a disaster. But listenership has not gone down, which means there is, I think, a lot of room for trusted organizations that are not media companies that don't need to profit on podcasts to make content for their audiences in this space. Um, this might be a little small to see, but um, it's pretty uh, used across age groups. Um, the 55 and older use podcasts a little less, um, but basically from measured 12 up to 54, there's wide usage. And it's more or less representative of race in the US in terms of listenership. So that's a little bit, a little teeny bit about why. 
Um, but the rest of the presentation, we're going to talk about five stages of podcast production. And I'm going to assume you're doing this in-house. I'm going to touch at the end a little bit on like if you're outsourcing things or if you're kind of doing a combination of outsourcing. Editing is about 80% of the work on this, and that's where you may be outsourcing it. Everything else is totally doable in-house. The editing is too, but, um, uh, but we're going to focus on, on if you were doing a DIY in-house. So we'll talk about planning, recording, editing, distribution, and marketing. So let's talk about show development first. You need a good show concept. Um, you need to go into it understanding why you're podcasting. This is not like social media, Facebook, Twitter, RIP, I mean X, um, or Instagram where you have to have one. You do not have to have a podcast. I have a book called Your Museum Needs a Podcast, but I always tell people, this is just for marketing purposes. You do not need a podcast, only if it is um, advancing your mission. So planning questions to ask before you get started. What can you afford, time or money? I always like to use a seesaw or a scales. You can make a podcast for almost free, but you're going to need to spend a lot of time doing it. Or you can outsource everything and you know, put a few hours into it on your side and give it to someone external to produce. So you're going to need one of those two things or a balance. So think about ahead, what can you afford, the type of podcast you make, the length you make. Um, really, I try to have organizations start with that and then scale the type of podcast to the time, especially the time budget. Um, what format, yes, what formats are feasible? Who are you trying to reach? This is really important before you even decide what type of podcast, um, internal or external. Is this an existing community? Are you trying to reach people in your department or in your organization or your industry? Or are you trying to talk to the general public? Um, what do you want to accomplish with the podcast? It would be cool to have a podcast. Unfortunately, even though I agree with that statement, is not a very good reason to podcast. So do you want to inspire people? Do you want people to connect around a common idea? Do you want to provide trustworthy information on topics that might be subject to misinformation? This kind of thing. Uh, is this a short-term or a long-term project? Podcasting can work really well, done consistently over a long period of time. But if you do not have the budget or the resources or the energy to make a podcast for two years. Um, think about that because that's going to change the type of content you make. And then, like I said, why is a podcast the best way to achieve this? Would a newsletter be a simpler, faster way to do it? Um, would an in-person event be better? What is it about the chance to sit down and listen to people talking for 40 minutes that works really well with what you're trying to accomplish? So really think about what this medium can do for you that others can't. So let's talk about a few types of podcasts that you might find yourself encountering and then what types might be better for you. So maybe some people listen to Today Explained by Vox. That's one of my favorite news podcasts. It's narrative, so script right, and, and interviews, sort of like mini documentaries. The goal is to inform and to entertain. It is fun to listen to, but it dives deep into a topic. Um, Hard Fork, if anyone's uh, interested in keeping up on AI, this is the best podcast to do that in a fun way. But Hard Fork is about tech. Um, it's structured conversation between the two expert journalist hosts with interviews brought in. But it's not an unstructured conversation. They are talking to each other off a, an outline. Um, I don't know if anyone listens to the Rockman Review. My husband is an open source intelligence, so I'm a defense in law. Um, but uh, he loves that podcast. And that podcast is primarily to inform. All podcasts should be entertaining. I know even the Dinfos podcast, a goal is to entertain. Um, it's important. People don't listen if it's not engaging. But this is not our primary goal um, here. So then you have things like the Always Sunny in Philadelphia podcast, which is absolutely purely about entertainment. You are getting no useful information. It's unstructured conversation. If anyone listens to that, it's very popular. Uh, it's just fun to listen to. There's nothing useful coming out of that. Uh, <laughs> and maybe even the opposite. And then we have things like narrative documentary podcasts. Me, I love a good cult miniseries. Um, we Crashed. It's narrative documentary. It's primarily to entertain. This is not hard-hitting journalism. It's about entertaining you with real stories. I think the traditional interview podcast is probably where most of you would end up if you're doing a podcast. It's where I recommend my clients think first. You can do structured dialogue. You can new, do narrative documentary. These start to get more time and money input, and you need a little bit more skill. 
Um, doing a traditional interview podcast is going to be the easiest to produce and to edit. So now thinking about who is your audience, like I said, internal versus external. Are you talking inward to, I don't know, people in the Navy? Are you talking outward to the general public? Um, is your is it an existing audience? Is this people you already have the ability to reach, the people that are already engaged in your mission? Or are you trying to draw new people in, which is a bit harder, so you'll have to be a bit more fun. It'll be, have to be a better podcast. <laughs> um, is it a captive audience, or do they need to be enticed to listen? It's really going to be the second one. You guys are a captive audience. More, even if I'm boring, you're probably going to stay to the end of the presentation. Um, but with podcast listeners, it's very easy to jump off in the first few minutes. So you really need to be engaging, and you need to entice them to make the jump to listen. Choosing to listen to 40 minutes of audio is a big decision, like picking up a book. Um, you're not just going to flip through a bunch and just start anything. You're going to think about it. Um, and are they an expert audience or a general audience? Really think about the expertise level of your audience so that they feel comfortable. We'll talk about that a bit more in a bit. Um, but you need to also find your niche. Um, what other media is available on this subject? What other podcasts are available? If there's other media, is it good? Could you just replace it with something good? Um, if it's good, how can you add your own spin to it? Um, how large is the audience for this subject? Um, things like that. The more niche with podcast, the better. The Navy podcast, sure, people will listen because you have a big reach. But that's not really the type of content that does well on podcasting. You want to get specific, right? Navy Moms in Arkansas podcast, things like that. Um, so one of the best ways I know of analogy to figure out how to find your niche is an analogy created by fellow podcaster Ian Elsner. And it's about Star Wars. So let's say you're starting a Star Wars podcast. You will never, ever be in the top Star Wars podcast. I don't think Lucas Films has the top Star Wars podcast, right? That's a heavy, saturated field. So maybe you narrow down. Um, you pick one topic in the Star Wars universe, you pick Ewoks. Oh, great. There's still a lot of content out there on Ewoks. And what does your audience want? Are they interested in how cute and fluffy they are? Are they interested in the cinematography? Are they interested in the anthropology of Ewok societies? So you've niched down, but you need a unique perspective. And so we'll talk about Ewok cosplayers. And now you have a community of Ewok cosplayers. You know what they're interested in. You know what they want to know. And you're able to fill a gap because there's no one making a podcast for them. They're going to be very loyal. So niche top topic, narrow down to a niche topic, and then add a unique perspective. And that's your formula for a good podcast topic. So now you have the perfect podcast idea. It's time to record. There are three kind of options for recording. A professional studio that you could pay time for. I don't think we need to do that. Uh, the DIY studio setup, um, which is pretty simple to do. And my favorite and the easiest of all is remote recording. There are so many easy ways to remote record these days. Everything really took off during the pandemic. Um, so that's a great easy way with low tech. So I'm going to talk about the last two in more detail. If you want to do something like a studio setup, you can get things like the Rode NT-USB Mini is $100. You can put it on a table, have a laptop, or um, the Rodecaster Pro if you want to get fancy. You have a little money to spend on toys. Um, that's like $500. But um, the mics are pretty cheap. You can plug them to a computer. You sit around. You have your conversation. Simple enough. For remote recording, there are some really cool platforms out there that do specifically record online for podcasts. You don't, if you can avoid it, you don't want to just record a Zoom call because you're going to have both voices layered on top of each other and we're all talking together and it's going to be really hard to edit. It's got that internet sound and that's just not fun to listen to. It needs to be good on your ears. <laughs> that's the professional technical term, good on ears. Um, so this is Riverside FM, and how it works is if I and the Secretary of Defense are doing an interview, we both log on to this online-only platform. There's no need to download anything. I know that's important um, for some people. And we'll use headphones. I'll plug in my mic if I have it, and I'll be able to check his mic and his sound, and then I'll hit record. And it records locally on your browser and then uploads afterwards. So you get two local recordings, which are much less likely to be affected by internet-y uh, nonsense. Now, uh, Squadcast also does that. And if you cannot do that, let's say I worked with the National Archives in the UK. 
during the pandemic, they could only use Microsoft Teams. No other software, can't plug anything into their computers. Um, I'm sure some people will relate to that. It was terrible, but what you can do, um, skipping, is use your smartphones. So uh, smartphones all have great microphones built in, so if you have to be on Zoom, have people wear headphones, put your, microphone, your um, smartphone uh, on some books like that, pop open your voice memo app, have each person record on either end, and then you have two local tracks that you can combine to have good sound quality or to as a backup. I like to use this as a backup even when using Riverside in case the internet has some sort of issue. Don't record in echoey spaces. <laughs> this is the number one rule. Don't do this in the kitchen. Don't do this in the big hall. Out there in the hall would be a terrible place to record a podcast. Carpeted spaces like this, small places, places with things on the wall, uh, that's where you want to go. AC units, fans, these are your worst enemies. Close the window. Always test, right, before you do a big important interview. Don't make your first guest a really important one. Do it with someone who, if it messes up, they'll be okay. <laughs> so, uh, interviewing tips. Uh, so there's two kind of ways that I'm framing this. Interviewing, uh, interviewing as a non-expert and then dialogue between experts. So we'll start with interviewing as a non-expert. Um, this is typically when you're listening to an interview podcast. Diane Reams is interviewing someone on NPR. She is not the expert. She might know a lot about the subject, but she's not there to provide her expertise. Um, her, any expertise she has in the subject, any research she's done, is there to set up the guest to best communicate what they want to communicate. So when you're interviewing as a non-expert, non you stand in for the audience. You're asking the questions that's popping into their head. And those are usually stupid questions. And I mean that not in a derogatory way, but in a, you know, you know the like, uh, this is more of a comment than a question, uh, questions. We don't want to do those. Your job is not to prove that you know anything about the topic. It's to use your expertise to provide the best start off point for, um, for your guest, and that can be meaning be informed. You know, sometimes when you hear interviewers asking a, a question that just doesn't make sense, and they're forcing the guest to talk about something that's irrelevant instead of getting to the good stuff. So expertise is in there, but um, be a good listener. Practice active listening and follow-up questions, asking the follow-up questions that your audience are wanting to know. So if you're talking about mold in base housing and someone said, but you know, ever since the zombies came through, the mold really issue hasn't been given the priority that we think it should be, and then they move on, you need to stop and go, wait, what do you mean zombies? Can you tell me a bit more about how that affected our planning? Um, so you want your, your listener to go, yes, exactly, that's what I wanted to know. If you are having a show where you're having dialogue between experts, whether it's two people that are regularly hosting the show, or you're bringing on someone and two people of equal uh, knowledge about the subject are going to dialogue, you still have to do a lot of planning and you have to think about structure. So this picture on the top that's all squiggly, that's how a normal conversation goes, right? You and I are talking, we go over here, we backtrack, we enter something personal, we come back, we test out what we want to talk about, we interrupt each other, um, but that's not fun to listen to. So when you're having dialogue, conversation on a podcast, you want it to be more like the second picture, where it can have a natural flow of a conversation, but it's linear, one idea flows to the next, you're going somewhere. It's easy to follow the train of thought. Um, one of the best ways to do that, both for both types of podcasting, all interviewing, it's really helpful to have a prep conversation. So 15 minute phone call where you talk to this person, um, I was doing an interview with someone who I didn't really feel authoritative on their subject matter, so I said, what questions do you not want to be asked? What questions are people not asking you? What are the topics that you don't get a chance to talk about? What's the thing you're most excited to talk about? Things like that. And then I take what they've told me and use that to create my interview. And it doesn't mean I have to be just pandering or only asking easy questions, but I'm figuring out what's going to get them most excited, what's going to get them talking most clearly, and what they're going to have the most to say on, right? Um, 
So a planning prep session is helpful. If you're having dialogue between experts as a host, maybe sitting down and creating an outline, making sure you have key points, maybe quotes, so that you're both working in the same order from A to Z in your information. Um, with dialogue between experts, you still have the audience in the room. I don't know if you've ever had like been in the room where it's three people and there's two people that know each other really well and they're talking about their mutual friends or interests and you're just like sitting there like feeling really awkward. You don't want the audience to feel like that. So even though they're listening to two experts talk on an expert level, you still want to make sure that they are considering the audience and looping them in. Um, just because you know something doesn't mean the audience doesn't. Um, so think of them as that third person. Fill them in. Make sure that they know what's going on. You don't want people to feel lost in audio. Once you feel lost in audio, like if you've lost your place in an audio book, you can't just like flip the page back. You really need to make sure people are following you the entire time. Once they're lost and confused, they may turn it off and do something else, put on music, right? So. Uh, Avoiding off-topic banter and chit-chat in the beginning, more rules for engaging conversation. Unless you are a comedy podcast, uh, I'll be honest, nobody wants to hear these two, you two people talking about the weather or your family. Uh, I'm guessing for the subject matter in this room, that just would not be relevant. Um, so get right to the good stuff, the meat of the interview, hence the, the shawarma picture, uh, visual aids. Um, put the best stuff right away. Three minutes in, hopefully I'm engaged, I'm excited, I'm interested. I'm like, ooh, yes, I do want to know about that. So if you have a guest where you need to get into their backstory, talk about the good stuff first. What are you working on? What is the crisis you're solving? Then backtrack to their, their origin story, right? Because we're not interested in people's background and their origin stories if we don't know what they're doing. Uh, you would not be interested in how I got to where I am if you don't think what I'm doing now is interesting. Um, and I actually, at the end, really love takeaways, recaps, lessons learned, final points, final thoughts. Um, it's a great time to get someone to summarize, to reflect. I think it's okay to be a little didactic in audio. You have to be a bit more obvious because we're not dealing with multiple inputs, like visual and audio. Um, people really need to be able to absorb it as you're saying it and then have something to reflect on afterwards. And editing. Editing is really important for making a clear, concise, easy to listen to podcast. Which brings us to editing. I think I might be blasting through my presentation, and we might have more time for questions, but <laughs> we'll go for it. We'll see what happens. Um, so when you're beginning to edit, uh, the one thing you'll need first is a digital audio workstation, an editing platform. And if you already know how to use things like Adobe Audition, Pro Tools, Logic X Pro, good for you. They're very hard to learn. Um, go ahead and keep using those. If you do not know how to use that, you don't need it. It's for music. You can use something like Hindenburg Journalist. It starts at $99. It is made for journalists and audio and narrative radio producers. So this is one of the only tools on the market that is specifically for non-music just for speaking audio. So it's really, really simple to learn. I've taught people with no editing experience, just go through the tutorials for a day and you'll have it. Um, really good tutorials on their website, it's really clear. It's, again, it's made for non-audio producers. Um, another really, really cool tool is Descript, which is an audio text editor. So you upload your audio, it transcribes it, and it's synced text to audio. And this works for video too, if anyone's doing video editing. And so you can cut and paste your text like you would in a Word document, and it cut and pastes your audio. Um, so this is a really, really cool document. It's really helpful if you're collaborating with people. Um, it may be helpful for you to develop your show and then pass it on to an editor. So some of my clients put their stuff together in here, and then I take it out, and I make it sound a little better. Um, the digital audio workstation. This is a close-up of Hindenburg. It's all text-based, so you can organize your clips. You can see it's really simple. Uh, not a lot of frills, not a lot of fluff. Um, and the frills that it doesn't include include uh, audio engineering. <laughs> so uh, this is my favorite tool uh, that not too many people know about. It is the ultimate hack. Um, before there was ChatGPT to write your papers, there was Auphonic to do your sound engineering. So it costs 
basically nothing, pennies on the, on the minute. You upload your audio, you click a preset, you hit go, and it can fix and transform almost any audio into something basically as good as you can get it. Um, I really can't usually get it better manually than this can do automatically. And you, it'll automatically get you to your volume level, which is negative 18 luffs. I don't know what luffs are, but that's how many luffs you need to have it sound loud enough in your ears. You don't want a podcast that you can't hear, right? You turned it all the way up in the car, you still can't hear it, you turn it off. So consistent volume is important. So Auphonic is, it's the best. Um, this is a close-up of Descript, the text and audio editor. And Descript has just last week purchased Squadcast, which is one of those remote recording platforms. So if you really want to be streamlined with one subscription, it's like 30 bucks a month, you can record your podcast on Squadcast, and it'll go right into Descript, and you can start editing it there. And you can, in theory, put your whole podcast there together and publish it out to, uh, to the, the podcast hosting service. Um, so Descript is really fun. And, and simple to use, again, made for non-audio editors. So that's how you edit, but what do you edit? What do you cut? So I kind of think of it like you know, woodworking, cutting down, woods, wood thinging, whatever that's called. You know, you cut it down. So first, you're going to do your major edits. Digressions in the conversations, segments that need to be cut for time, that blank section where someone went to open the door or let their cat out of the room these kind of things. You're cutting it down to about the size you want. Get everything down. Um, and this can be really important. It is much easier to listen to a 40-minute a conversation that's been cut down to the best 30 minutes. Um, then you want to go through another pass, and you do your minor edits. And this is subjective, how much of this you need to do. But filler words, long silences, loud breaths, the small stuff that you want to do that after you've made your major cuts. But this is going through and making those little tweaks that will make it sound better and more enjoyable. Uh, just as a rule of thumb, I often try and take out 80% of filler words. Even if I could, I would never take out 100% because ums are natural. Um, but I say um a lot, and I do not want all my ums in my audio. So I cut out 80% of those. And I would always err on the side of a natural sound versus um, cutting out something you don't want. So if it sounds you know, cut, it sounds like you just chopped in the middle, leave the um in. It's natural. Uh, speech is a lot less, speech isn't grammatically accurate. <laughs> Let's put it that way. My transcripts of audio never uh, uh, follow grammatical rules. Then you've got that done. You can go through and add your intro or outro, the welcome to this podcast. I like to record these as separate um, narration. It just gives it a, a different sound. They might sound better. It's a way to sometimes reflect on the conversation and tease the audience with what you're about to hear. We're going to talk about this, really get them excited for what's to come. You can record this while you're doing the interview. If you want to have a pre-prepared um, the welcome to the this pod, the Dinfos podcast, whatever it is. Today we're going to do this. My guest is this. Hi, um, my guest is John. Hi, John. Um, you can do that, but you're going to add that all in. Add your theme music if you want. A little bit of the intro, outro, totally optional, but it can be fun. Um, then you go through again from start to finish, checking for timing, fine edits, information flow, making sure that everything is sounds great, and then. Export and I would recommend proof listening or at least spot checking your audio to an MP3. If you're writing an uh, intro outro script, or maybe you've got a little bit of script in the middle, or maybe you're doing a whole narrative podcast, which I said I wasn't going to cover, but we'll touch on that a bit. Um, some tips for writing narration and script is to write like you speak, especially for you academics in the room. I'm a former academic. Um, it can be tempting to use long sentences, lots of clauses, um, but that's not how we speak. We start with the information that's most relevant that you need to know within the sentence structure. Um, sometimes we trail off. We don't use correct grammar when we speak, like I said, so write like you speak. Um, pay attention to what order you give information in. Don't repeat information. This is the one, the one thing podcasts of this genre tend to do is you've got the introduction and you've introduced with this extra long bio, the guest. And then in your interview, you then talk about the guest's bio. So don't repeat information, especially unnecessarily. People are listening to it one after the other. Um, 
if you want to add music and or sound effects, if you're feeling really fancy, uh, these are some places you can get low cost or free, awesome, royalty free music. Soundstripe is my favorite and they let you download two free songs as a trial that you can use forever on your podcast. Uh, lots of good stuff there, Epidemic Sound, the Free Music Archive if you have time to sort through some bad stuff. Um, free Sound and Soundly are really fun. People upload sounds into the public domain. I have found teacups, uh, antique airplanes in flight, the sound, fake sound of a volcano erupting, the underwater noises of the Reykjavik Harbor, uh, things like that. Whatever you might need, you can find, usually find it there. Okay. I think we have 15 minutes left, right? Yeah. Plus questions. Great. So time to talk about just distribution and marketing. This is my handy dandy graph of how your podcast gets out into the world. You have produced this amazing podcast, which you now know how to do completely. Um, you have an MP3. You're going to use a podcast hosting service. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up, but this is actually the easiest part of producing a podcast. I like Podbean and Transistor FM. So if you want to make a podcast, just use those two. Um, and so you upload your MP3. They will create your RSS feed. They will do all that for you. You just tick the boxes of where you want to distribute your podcast. And it'll push it out to all the platforms. And that means every time you upload your episode, once this is set up, you upload, you hit publish, it goes out everywhere. You upload, you hit publish, it goes out everywhere. And most pod, there's the few big ones that you have to set up. And then all the little small ones out in the world, they usually pull from like the Apple podcast feed or things like that. So if you properly set up your distribution um, settings on your hosting service, you will be available to listen to everywhere that people listen to podcasts. And it is really important that you do that. Do not create a podcast and just put it on SoundCloud. I will come haunt you. <laughs> Do not make a podcast and just put it on Spotify, please, or say we're going to upload it later. That's like oh, only having a door this tall for your museum, is what I tell people. You need to have this accessible. Make sure that people can listen however they want. People are not going to listen on your website, by and large. They're going to listen on the podcast platform that they already use, which in the US, the majority for adults is Apple Podcasts. You can download the slides or take a picture of this if you want the full instructions. I'm not going to cover it, but um, we already did number three. Um, I am going to tell you about this pod.link. This is a great website. So when you've published your podcast now, how do you find the links to everywhere it is that you can share them? If you go to pod.link, you can put in any podcast that's already been published on Apple, and up will pop this basically customized website of your show where people can listen on there even if they don't know how to listen to podcasts and then you have all the links. In addition to this or instead of this, you might have a home page or show notes on your website, a dedicated space for your podcast where it's easy to find your podcast, a link that's easy to share with other people that are interested. Um, you might have a main pod, uh, page and then your show notes a lot of shows have for each episode, especially if you're communicating information, you're educating your extra links. A transcript is really important for accessibility. There are a lot of people out in the world who cannot listen for whatever reason, who would love to consume this information and who like to read podcast transcripts. Um, and that's helpful for SEO as well if it's embedded in your website. Again, if you don't have that, you can use something like pod.link and just hyperlink out to, in the show description, provide a, a short URL for where people can find transcripts. I always recommend making it really obvious where the transcripts are. Some tips for a successful show launch. First of all, choose a short, unique name. Uh, that's important. Long won't show up. It might be hard to remember. These are all great names. You might not uh, be able to get something that small. Um, for my own show, for the field, the museum field, it's We the Museum. It's short. I think it's catchy. Um, but as short and informative as you can be, which is, is a real challenge. And make sure to check pod.link, for example, that no one else has that show name. When I first started working with the National Archives in the UK five years ago, uh, we all decided on on the record uh, as a podcast name. And you can imagine there are a lot of podcasts with on the record as the name. That did not, that was a bad choice. <laughs> and they're stuck with it. 
Um, my bad. Uh, show, great show artwork. This is really important. This is your book cover. As people are perusing, they might stop and check it out. Uh, and it needs to look good as a thumbnail, like a 150 by 150. Open up your podcast app. Look how big the show art is. That's how small it needs to look good. So bold colors are great. Big text. Your text on your podcast cover art cannot be too large and cannot take up too much of that tile. So that's really important. Um, craft a compelling show description. This is your elevator pitch for your show. It's really important. A lot of people really drop the ball at this stage. You've made this amazing show. Remember the Tate, Tate Britain, like the famous art gallery. They had a podcast for all called the Tate Podcast. No. And then the description was, great stories from the Tate. And I was just like, it was so heavily produced. It was a beautiful show. And the description was, stories from the Tate. I never listened past a few minutes on principle, because I didn't want to give them those listens, because that was just bad behavior. <laughs> so a compelling show description that says who the show is for and why you have to listen. For example, my show, We the Museum, I'm like, this is a show for podcast workers who want to form a more perfect institution. This is for people who want to improve our institutions. You're going to have inspiring conversations with people who are doing just that. So give people the who it's for and the what they're going to get and why they won't get anywhere else. I really recommend doing a two-minute audio trailer of your podcast as well. Um, this can be a, just some clips over music. It's a great way to test out your podcast hosting service. Um, so that you aren't messing up launch on day one. You get a chance to work out the kinks. Um, you can also turn these into social media videos. Um, so that takes us more, more into the marketing world. So headliner.app is another free or there's an, a premium version if you want to upload your own uh, brand identity that is an amazing, amazing uh, free tool that creates those kind of social media videos that you may have seen with captions and a background and a little waveform. Um, it's really easy to use. It's pretty user friendly. Um, you can upload uh, captions if you want to get captions created, like on rev.com, for example, or it will automatically transcribe and you can correct those captions. It's really great to take the best, like a 30 to 90 second clip from your podcast, something really tantalizing, really juicy that's going to make people want to jump in and listen, uh, turn it into a social media clip. Post that on all your platforms. The cool thing about Headliner is you can make squares, uh, landscape, or TikTok size. I know TikTok's not. <laughs> Instagram real size, let's put it uh, for, for this audience. Um, and even, for example, uh, Bloomberg, the crypto podcast, they've, put, they've used Headliner to put their entire podcast on YouTube with a, it's just got a wavelength in the background. You could do that with rotating pictures. It's a nice way to make a slightly more user-friendly version of audio podcasts on YouTube. Most people do not listen to audio podcasts on YouTube, but why not put it there, especially if you already have an audience. Another thing to remember is that, in terms of marketing, is that podcasts are evergreen content. So when you post on social media, you got as much as you got, and then it's gone, right? You're not reposting your own content later, by and large. You might bring back a good image. Podcasts are evergreen. People do not mind you bringing it back up. It is designed in, at mo for most shows to be listened to, you know, even a few years later, hopefully it will still be interesting. So for example, this was two years after we released the, uh, an episode of the National Archives podcast on Noor Inayat Khan, who's a super cool spy, uh, if anyone hasn't heard of her. Um, and, and two years after the podcast came out, she got a blue plaque, you know, a historical sign in England. So that was a great time to bring back the episode and be like, hey, Noor's in the news. If you want to learn more about her, we have this content on our website for you on podcast platforms with the really generic title. So then evaluation. Uh, how do you know if you did good? Uh, podcasts are not like social media. So if you're used to social media numbers, you will be very sad when you first look at your podcast numbers and you'll feel very defeated. So you've got to go in knowing that the numbers are different. Now remember that I said um, almost everyone who starts the podcast will finish it. So when you're looking at those numbers, think about people who have listened to 20 to 40 minutes of your content. Um, I typically think about an in-room uh, event with museums. If you got 200 people once a month for a year to come in over and, and start bringing their friends, and it grew by the end to 300, would you be happy with your output? There's also a few ways to measure. Um, so the way you want to measure, I should backtrack, 
is downloads per episode X amount of days after publishing. So you'll see measurements of seven days after publishing and 30 days after publishing. And this will give you a consistent benchmark that hopefully over time you'll start to see go up and up. And that's how you'll measure growth. So it doesn't really matter what you start at as long as that number goes up. But if you want to know and compare and brag if it's doing well or whatever, um, these are two podcast hosting platforms that release relative numbers. So Buzzsprout is a big one, and they say among our podcasts, if you get 5,100 downloads after the first seven days, you're the top 1% of all podcasts. Um, if you get 31 downloads, you're in the top 50%, so you're still doing OK. Um, after 30 days, uh, if you get 150 downloads after 30 days, you're in the top 50%. So if you're hitting a few hundred at release, this is my, for when I'm talking to museums who might not have as big an audience, depending on your existing audience. If you're hitting 150, 200, 300, that's great. Again, what matters is that as you're releasing episodes, it's growing. And if you're going to do a limited series, factor in a lot of marketing. You need to release it over and over and over to slowly build those numbers up over time. Transistor FM is one of those podcast hosting platforms, and they have a new tool called Release Window. And so they measure your downloads in your first two days, so your release window over time. And if that, is, again, is going up, that's, you can kind of measure your subscriber number. The amount of people that are going to download your podcast on day one and two are your loyal subscribers. Some other tools, if once you have a few downloads under your belt, Apple Podcasts will start showing you data for just their listeners. And you'll have to log in via their thing to access it. You can figure that out. You're all smart. But um, what they'll give you that no one else does is listeners, engaged listeners, um, amount of time listened. Um, and so you see there on the bottom right, you have following and not following. So you can see that 66% of people who listen to my old podcast, the first one I ever did, um, their subscribers. Um, and you can see new followers. So they'll kind of give you a sense of growth and of how many people are subscribed. They will also tell you average consumption per episode. This is really cool as well. No one else does this. So you can see that um, maybe on average 75% of people, people listen to 75% of every episode on average. So that's pretty good. Again, like I said, if people are listening to most or all of every episode, they start. So if that all doesn't look fun, outsourcing. Um, here are some terms you might need to know. Uh, editor, someone who cuts and organizes and assembles. Your editor is typically going to work per hour. Editors run from $35 to $80 an hour. Um, audio engineer is typically someone who's working more technically with recording and mastering of vocals. The person doing your podcast may also do and probably will do audio engineering, but that's not specifically the person you're looking for. Um, a producer is, might, might only be involved with facilitating the interview, with conceptualizing the show, or they could edit. Um, and a production company, that's what you're going to look for if you just want to hand something off to someone start to finish, and you don't want to be involved. Or you want to be a little bit involved, um, and you have more time than money. Uh, no, more money than time. Um, so an editor and a producer is typically what you're looking for. This is a very unstandardized industry in terms of names and labels. So when you're looking to outsource, do not assume that everyone's offering the same thing. So the way to choose an editor producer is to first listen to what they made. Do you like it? Is it good to listen to? Does it sound good? That's really important. If it doesn't sound good, they probably won't do good on yours. <laughs> um, ideally, find someone who understands your organization, your mission, who may have produced shows within your genre. And then ask them to walk you through each step start to finish so that you understand the process and what they're offering within their price. Um, and if you get a few quotes and one stands out, again, ask them to explain why. because. They may just be offering a different package than someone else. Like I said, it's not standardized. So don't assume the offering is the same from one person to the other. I have on my website some more talks, recorded talks, series that I've done. If you want to spend even more time listening to this or get into more of the subjects in detail, um, betterlemonaudio.com, some more resources there. And that's it for me. And again, if you want to download the slides, it's tinyurl.com slash dinfospod. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that. We'll now open up the floor to some questions if anybody has some. Is this right? Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name's Hannah. I'm with the Defense Travel Management Office. Um, so you were talking about interview techniques. One of the reasons that we're considering um, creating a podcast is um, because we have some people we would like to interview um, who are not comfortable on camera and mm. don't want to be in our videos. Um, but there still might be issues with interviewing, even through a podcast. Do you have any tips or... Uh, approaches to interviewing people who aren't comfortable with with this kind of process? Yeah, so I'm actually working right now on a second and third and fourth podcast for the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, an organization that's partnered a lot with the State Department. They deal with victims of uh, conflict related to sexual violence, um, genocide survivors, you know, they're working at the Rohingya, they're working in Colombia, they're working in um, all over the country, the world on places like this, South Africa. So. We've interviewed some people who, again, wouldn't want to be on camera, some people who want to be anonymous. I think really being clear with people about how it will be released, that this will only be audio, that we will make sure that your name's not in there. If they're still uncomfortable, um, you could ask them to write out a statement and record it so they know exactly what they're saying. Um, providing people with a transcript of their statement to review afterwards is really important. I do that with a lot of my guests anyway, just because Rarely do people have, want to like retract something they've said, but it gives them the, the, the security to know that if I said something that incriminates myself or that puts myself in danger, right, um, I, can, I can remove that. In the actual interview, what you can do is make sure that you're warming up people. Um, it is more important, especially in those situations, to make people feel comfortable than it is to get just the right audio. So if someone's bumping the table, Honestly, unless they're really confident and wouldn't mind if I interrupted them, I just, I just let it go. We're, we're more important with, to get their story, um, especially in situations like you're describing. But as you're, when you're talking to people, I like to start, explain exactly how this is going to be released, who they're talking to, why we're recording this, why we want to hear from them, what we want to hear from them. And then, I don't know in this situation if you're appropriate, but I often make a joke. If you insult your colleague, if you say something you don't want, we can always cut that out. Um, and you can tell them, as you're recording, if you say something and you say, I don't want that in there, you just say, and then we'll know to cut that out. And you'll get a chance to review. So these are a few ways to make people more comfortable about recording audio. And you could also say, for example, we won't label the file with your name. Uh, we will label it with anonymous speaker in Bangladesh, for example, which is what we did in one file. So Ms. Hethman, we have one question from online. Uh, how have you seen the interaction between social media and podcasts, whether it be using social media to boost podcasts or vice versa? I know personally, like, I've listened to podcasts, and they're like, hey, like, check us out on XYZ social media. Yeah. Um, social media is a place to promote your podcast. Um, but the nice thing about it is uh, you're not just like publishing a link, like consume our thing, buy our ticket. A subscribe to our thing. It's not you're not just asking people. You're providing content for them. I think generally, if people like you, they're excited that you make a podcast. Um, and using video clips, like I talked about, is a great way to not just be like, visit this link, do this thing. But here, here's something for you to enjoy. Here's something for you to think about. If you want to then jump over to the podcast, you can. Um, in my field, and I would guess in yours, there's less of this like building this social media community. You know, like the Always Sunny in Philadelphia podcast has its own social media, and people want to comment, they want to share. Um, that might not be as much the case for, for us and for you. Um, I definitely don't recommend making a separate uh, account for your podcast. Uh, publish it on the existing audience you have. Uh, it, it's very hard to build up a social media audience from a podcast specifically, unless you're just getting really good downloads and you're just really like hitting. Um, which we, we are never going to do <laughs> in the museum field, in your field. It's just not going to happen um, because we are not doing, we are not specifically out there doing any, whatever we need to do just to entertain and get numbers. That's not our goal, so that's probably not what we're going to achieve. We had another question from online. Oh, wait, she had a question in person. Oh, wow. <laughs> go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, just turn it on. 
Hello? Yep. Yeah, okay, you're good. Hi, I'm Brianna from NSWC Corona. I'm a writer. Um, I was just wondering, what tips or pointers would you give to those who are thinking about incorporating video for their uh, podcast rather than just audio? Yeah, so a lot of people record a video and they have it all set up and then they use the audio as podcasts. Um, video podcasting is not my area of expertise. I do find that the consumers and users of video podcasts are more likely to be entertainment podcasts, comedy podcasts, um, things like that, like the Always Sunny podcast, all those Reddit podcasts where they read off the crazy stuff on Reddit, um, people talking about music or visual arts. So if your thing is relevant and it, it would help to, to be visual and it's in one of those categories, set up a good, you're going to have to have a much better uh, setup equipment wise. It's much harder to get that video quality but once you get there. Um, I would still say the podcast audio then can be a point, uh, a way to tighten that up to take out the pauses and the ums that can't be sliced up tiny like that in video. And then just be really mindful that your uh, people recording are not assuming that people can see them. So even though people can see them in the video, make sure that they're describing things for the audio listeners. Oh, we got our museum guy. Not, not come up here with uh, the whole museum thing. So consider this your official invite to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. We cannot pay your way, but feel free to come tell our story. <laughs> and I know the uh, National Coast Guard Museum is represented here too. They may want to talk to you. Uh, our biggest thing too, and I've tried it in the past with our interviews were video heavy, and I've turned a couple of them into podcasts. Um, we're not, uh, you know, we don't have a presence on Spotify and things like that. We normally upload them to DVIDs. Uh, we don't see as much traction there, but our biggest thing is trying to get everything 508 compliant and getting those transcripts so it's all lines up with regulation to make it available mm. for everyone. And, and I know you, you hit on that, but yeah, what's the best way to try and get those like transcribed? So. We're hitting on all cylinders. Oh, yeah. If you're transcribing things, there are several options. Rev.com is the go-to. You can get AI transcriptions, which you'll need to correct, or you can get human transcriptions. Um, you can also pay a private human transcriber. I had this nice lady in Kenya that did mine for a while. Um, but Rev can get you human transcriptions or captions. Um, there are all kinds of, like, Descript, if you have a Descript account. The transcription is built in. Again, it's AI, so you will have to go through and correct it. They will mess up names and technical stuff. Um, if you have the budget for a human transcription, it's a time saver, but you know, money time. Um, and then there's no way to, <laughs> I started working with the Archives of American Art, and they're like, you have to burn in the captions and the transcript. And I'm like, you can't do that with audio. And they're like, it's in our Smithsonian regulations that it has to be that way. And I'm like, you can't do that. Um, and so we had it back and forth. And they eventually realized that you can't do that. And so, but you can link to the transcript within the episode description. And not all podcast listener apps have uh, hyperlinks, live links. So that's why I do things like tinyurl.com, a short URL, or a single website you know, this is the, the, the easy to, to transcribe, to type in link where you can find all our transcripts easily available. I usually make them available as a PDF download with a large text font, at least 12, and then also as maybe embedded into the website so that you can read it on the web page and web readers can, can access it. Yep. Hi, I'm Emily from 20th Air Force. So we have a podcast. Um, it was a go-do, create a podcast. The next episode, um, our general wants to do a panel, and I was wondering if you have any tips for having multiple people that he would be interviewing. In person? or? Um, I think this one would have to be through, we've been doing Zoom, it's but I might easier check out to do this. It's so much easier to do this remotely. It really, really, really is. Riverside FM will let you have eight people at a time. Uh, I would not recommend having eight people talking over each other. Four, maybe, is a maximum. Uh, as people are talking, make sure they introduce themselves. This is Hannah again, or, um, OK, Hannah, what would you like to say? So that it's obvious who's talking, um, especially if it's all male voices or female voices, it might be hard to follow along. Um, maybe have a discussion ahead, like I said, a pre-planned outline of what you want to follow so that it's not just that kind of aimless conversation. But again, those would be some tips if you want to do a panel discussion. Thank you. So one question we have from online is, have you had success with audiograms as a way to advertise your podcast for social media? I think that's like the headliner.app uh, that yeah. I showed. I think that's what you would call an audiogram. 
<laughs> I hope I'm answering that question just like a video that has the audio and the text um, captions going. And the fun thing about those is you can read the captions even if you're somewhere that you can't be listening to um, uh, out loud on your phone. So yeah, those are huge and really, really important in converting people from social media to, um, to listening, as is email. Email and the audiograms, the video, the little audio video uh, cards are really, really helpful. Nice. Thank you. And we have one more question from online. Does the remote web-based recording software work from smartphones? The Riverside actually does have an app. I would recommend using it from desktop if you can, um, but it does have an app. Now, also something I didn't mention in the past, Riverside has run into firewall issues with the universities and government websites, I have found. Um, I think they've mostly fixed those issues, but make sure you test out any remote recording platform if you are in an institution that has firewalls uh, so that it works and you don't find your guest. And make sure your guest has a secondary way to meet you and, and talk to you so that they're not sitting trying to get in and, and being lost. But yeah, there is an app for, um, for Riverside. OK, I lied. There is one more question on, on online. I apologize. Uh, Miss Morris, coincidence, not mine, but we're not related, um, asked, we're not in a place to host, but want to pitch our SMEs as guests on both military slash official and niche shows. Is the etiquette the same as pitching to a guest, pitching a guest to a broadcast or print platform? What is that acronym? The, the SME, pitching. subject matter expert. OK. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, yeah, I would say um, make sure that you are pitching to a show that has like guests. Um, first of all, I have had so many pitches for people like, I want to be on the National Archive show. And I'm like, that's not an interview show. Like, It's only talking to internal people. You clearly didn't listen. So make sure that you understand the show and what they do. And you could first make an inquiry if they are accepting um, pitches for guests. Um, and then if you do pitch, just make sure that you're communicating why your guest fits the mission of the show, not that you've sent an email out to anybody who has a podcast. Um, there might also be some websites that help do this. I don't know off the top of my head. I do know that Good Pods, is it no, Pod Chaser. Pod Chaser has like you can. Like if you have a subject matter expert and they've been on five podcasts, you can kind of add guests to things and so to kind of connect them as like a podcast profile. So if you want to build up that like this person does podcasts, that can be a great way to go. Okay, Ms. Hefman, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for listening. On behalf of Colonel McNorton, on behalf of Colonel McNorton, I would like to present to you this certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much for your time today so and this much. coin. Awesome. Thank you. OK, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the first day of our 2023 social media forum. I ask you to please hold on to your badge and then just bring it tomorrow and wear it when you're in the building. Tomorrow we will begin at 0900 with a quick welcome followed by our first speaker, Ms. Tracy Batican from the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the evening.